a new mandate for the UN in Sudan. More than a decade ago, the United Nations was tasked with stopping a civil war. Now they're being asked to build peace. But is it too soon to change course? I'm Imran Garda, and today's newsmaker is Sudan's path to peace. Soon, the UN's official peacekeeping mission to stop genocide and crimes against humanity in Sudan will come to an end. But they're not leaving completely. For almost 13 years, UN troops have tried to keep peace after a brutal conflict in Darfur, which killed hundreds of thousands. Now, the UN has authorized a new mission starting next year to help Sudan's government transition to democracy. But is it the right time to go from peacekeeping to peace building? It's been just over a year since President Omar al-Bashir was ousted and the country remains fragile. And in Darfur, fighting may have declined, but the conflict is unresolved and violence continues to this day. So once UN troops leave those vital areas, what could happen next? Natalie Perhernan reports. This group of demonstrators in Khartoum may be small in number, but their calls for justice ring loudly. They gathered to remember pro-democracy protesters who were killed in a crackdown outside army headquarters last June. We took to the streets under this heat despite the coronavirus because we wanted to commemorate their memory because they revived the nation. We remember them in our hearts. There's little faith here that the authorities will deliver justice. More than 120 people were killed on June 3 last year, according to doctors. The authorities said 87 died. That attack happened after months of peaceful protests in Sudan, which led to the ousting of decades-long dictator Omar al-Bashir. In the immediate aftermath, military leaders took control. But a transitional government of civilian and military representatives was later set up. They're almost a year into a three-year transition period, after which the country is meant to move to a civilian-led administration. But it's just now that the UN has formed a new political mission, UNITAMS, to help Sudan's move to democratic governance. But will the people who took to the streets for change see this outside help as crucial to keeping the revolution on track? While the UN has set up a new mission in Khartoum, it's also extended its peacekeeping operation in the western region of Darfur. The mission to protect civilians started in 2007, and while there are plans to ultimately draw down troops, security concerns mean that won't happen yet. There have been periods of peace since a civil war broke out here in 2003 that left more than 300,000 people dead, and displaced more than one million people. But the fear of ongoing intercommunal violence means people like Ishag Babika can't return home. I will thank God when security returns. People will go back home so that we can live the way we used to and develop our area with schools and hospitals. Bashir is wanted by the International Criminal Court to stand trial on war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide charges for atrocities allegedly committed in Darfur. It would have been almost unthinkable before the revolution, but Sudanese authorities have agreed to cooperate with the court. It does mark a major shift in how Sudan has been ruled, but in this new era, demonstrators are still waiting for most of the reforms that brought them out in the first place. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now from Uganda's capital, Kampala, by Abdulatif Rahman, also known as Thibault. He's a member of the High Command Council of the Sudan Liberation Movement, the faction chaired by Abdul Wahid and Noor. In Washington, D.C., is Cameron Hudson, who was the former chief of staff to the U.S. Special Envoy to Sudan. And in London is Abu Bakr Adam the uh, former chair of the UK Sudanese Lawyers Association. Gentlemen, really good to have you all on the program. Abu Bakr Adam, let me start with you. So we've got a new acronym to, to learn here, UNITAMS. We've got this transition from UNAMID to UNITAMS. The UN has a plan. Is it the right plan? 
Yeah, um, we welcome the United Nations Integrated Transition Assistance Mission in Sudan, uh, UNITAM. Um, this is um, a very good move by the government and the United Nations uh, as um, addition to the UNIMED. As we know that it's going to go in phases, and it's going to be kind of transition. And as the name says, it's the integrated function, which is going to work with the different uh, part of the UN uh, uh, offices in Sudan and to move from peacekeeping to peace building, which is a long and is a very big uh, effort for the Sudan and challenge, actually. So right. I think we, are, we welcome more by the United Nations and by the Sudanese government. Okay, well, you know, good to hear that from you. I wonder what Abdul Latif Rahman thinks about this, also known as Thibault. Sir, as a representative of, a, of an armed group that's currently involved in the conflict on the ground, when the UN says we're moving from peacekeeping to peace building, your reaction is what? Uh, thank you for giving me opportunity. Uh, the overall withdrawal of the UNIMED mission is related to the situation on the ground in Darfur, as well as the political crisis in Sudan. And if we look at the political situation in Sudan, the situation looks uh, very bleak. And frankly speaking, uh, His Excellency uh, Prime Minister Hamdok's government is in a powder cage. We have the civilian elements uh, of the of the of the transitional government, which she struck a compromising deal with Al Bashir's uh, security committee, the civilian government is much divided, with a lot of rivalry currents within it. It is uh, and therefore it is not acting in unison. It is struggling to assert it is authority after all the move and. And, and everything was taken by the, the military establishment. Mm -hmm. And that is why you see the daily jump of these forces from the bandwagon of the transitional government. Right. This is on in one hand. On the other hand, we have tension and mistrust between the chairman of the Sovereign Council, Al-Burhan, and his deputy, Hamidi. Tension and mistrust is growing up rapidly and, uh, it, and might end up into a develop, uh, it might develop into army uh, confrontation between the army and the rapid support, support forces. Okay. As Al-Bashir's general, C. Hamidi, uh, as a tool of purpose, oh, right. he should know his place, and Tiba. that should not aim right. high. Right. Given Tiba. this, Tiba. Tiba. give me a, give me a yes. second here. I'm going to come back to you, and I want to specifically ask you about specific instances of violence, such as what happened in Jebel Marra recently. I'm going to come back to you in, in a minute or two, but I want to bring in Cameron Thank Hudson you. to the point of trust here. For a lot of Sudanese, with the UN creating some sort of vacuum, even though things will get repurposed, renamed, reshaped or whatever, creating a sort of vacuum and putting things in the hands of the same military, mostly the same military that was accused of genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity, they feel this is a sort of death sentence. Is that correct? Well, I don't know that it's a death sentence, but uh, it's not a perfect outcome, right? I think that we've seen in the past few weeks and months over 100 Darfuri civil society organizations protesting the departure of UNAMID, they still don't feel safe. They don't feel safe to leave the internally displaced persons camps that they have spent the better part of a decade in. They don't feel safe to try to return to, uh, to normal life. And as you point out, uh, the government really hasn't changed. Yes, we have a new uh, civilian face, which I think is implementing many, many important uh, reforms in the uh, in the space of personal freedom. But when it comes to the control of the security situation in the country, that remains firmly in the hands of the military and the paramilitary forces that brought about all of the conflict. Um, and it's not just in Darfur. We should point out that the Nuba Mountains in the southern part of the country, the eastern part of the country, have all seen an uptick in tribal violence. Mm -hmm. uh, many of uh, many of those uh, 
uh, bouts of violence. Uh, it is rumors, rumored and alleged that the military and the RSF forces had a role to play in stoking that. Of uh, All of the governors of all of Sudan states are currently military generals of the old regime. So there is a very heavy uh, political and security presence that right. the military still controls that the UN will be very, um, you know, have a very hard time uh, reining in through this new mission. Yeah, it's worth noting that the UNITAM's statement or the statement from the UN about the creation of this doesn't just include Darfur, it, inclu it, Darfur, it includes the southern Kordofan and Blue Nile area as well, which of course gives you an indication that they're not just looking at this one place. Abu Bakr Adam, so we began this program with you saying this is a good idea, then we heard from the other two guests who are saying, well, ostensibly maybe it's a good idea, but they are, there are a lot of issues on the ground related to instability, insecurity, millions of IDPs, and lack of trust among many actors here, which means that well, we just don't know. Are you partial to some of that criticism? Yeah, I share with, uh, with uh, all the peers and worries about the security and instability in uh, Darfur. But we sh I'm also mindful that this is not a replacement of the UNIMED. There is a twin set resolution. So on one hand, the UNIMED will continue for the next six months and also, as we know that even the UNIMED now, in addition to the peacekeeping in some parts of Sudan, they're also playing role of peace building. And the UNITEM, when it take over, it's just, we know that the first part of it, they're gonna work together. And that's why uh, the resolution is well written, that to indicate that there is kind of transformation from UNIMED to, uni, uh, to UNITEM, and within this period, because it is integrated, we assume that there's sign of continuity in some parts of Sudan, and it's not going to leave any gap because right. we are aware. Every knows that there is issue of stability and safety. Right, in right, right. right. And and we... Abu Bakr, sorry to interrupt you, right? Because I want to bring in Abdul Latif uh, Rahman here, Thibault. You have been accused, your group has been accused of being a spoiler here. So we've had the government just last week saying. You attacked them in Western, Western Jabal Marra, killed women and children, killing civilians. They say, well, you know, you guys don't want to come to the, to the table. You don't want to be involved in the peace talks between the government and the rebel groups. And you're attacking troops and killing civilians. You don't want peace. Address that for me. Yeah, uh, it is clear that the, the uh, uh, Civilian protection, it is not a significant concern of the transitional government. Uh, the, uh, there is, today, there is a dire need for viable, strong international presence on the ground. The attacks of government militias and its forces is going on a daily basis. They say you started the it last week, government, They say you started it last week. Uh, no, let me, let me clarify sure. this. The, the attack is going on a daily basis, and the transitional government is not even issuing a statement to condemn this attack against civilian population, as if Darfur is in another country. It is on 5th of May, last Friday, when uh, regimes, uh, armed forces, shelled Mara village with barrage of heavy artillery, in which he fights. Eight civilians were killed, including a Pyrenean woman, Halima uh, uh, Hamid. And before this, our forces re rebalsed government's attack in areas of western Jabal Marra. It is not right time to have uh, UNITAMS because UNITAMS is concerned with peace building and in Darfur, Nuba Mountain and Blue Nile, the situation not only volatile, it is exacerbating to the wars. There is a dire need for a uh, uh, strong peace making mechanism that can protect civilians and prevent armed conflict to happen. And, and us, so everybody and country will be busy dealing with this after masses of COVID-19. The militias, the jet, the bitro oil dollars coming from uh, 
United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia will dry out and the militias will not get paid. Okay. And okay. therefore, okay. they find themselves have no option but to resort to 2004 scorched airs policy in right. order to massively loot, but also to expand the areas and lands usurped from indigenous owners. If what you're saying is true, this means that we're going back to a very dangerous period here. And I wonder... Cameron Hudson and, and, and Thibault, it's not, you know, I'm not disbelieving you. It's just that it's very hard to independently verify these things on the ground, right? And Cameron Hudson, I remember in past iterations, I'd spoken to Scott Gratian multiple times when the United States was, was more actively involved here in Darfur. Big question marks about, okay, what happens once the UN leaves? Are we going to see this, this vacuum that's going to need international intervention again from the United States and the UN and others to, to stop the bleeding? Yeah. Well, I think we have to look at the international approach to Sudan um, and this UN mission as accomplishing only one of two essential tasks. Right. So one essential task is to support and to strengthen the civilian government in the country. We haven't had this opportunity in uh, 30 years. And so it's a critical opportunity now that we have to support civilian rule and to demonstrate that civilian leaders can run this very fractious country. But the other thing that this mission doesn't accomplish is to reform and frankly to weaken the role of the military and the paramilitary forces in the political life of the country. Right. Nobody's saying that Sudan should not have a military, but militaries are used for external defense. They should not be used to put down restive populations. There should be a political process to do that. And until we can reform the security services in the country, I'm afraid that you're not going to see the kind of durable democratic change uh, that you want to right. see in the country, no matter how much we strengthen the civilian rulers. Abu Bakr Adam, how do you find a way to fix those security forces and the entire security infrastructure that was built up over Bashir's reign. The resolution itself mentioned that uh, the role of uh, the unit system is to help and assist with uh, reforming the uh, security forces. Uh, so this issue is being addressed. If we look at Article 12, 13, 14, and 15, it clearly says that how they want to manage the transmission and also the coordination between the unit, unit terms and other missions in the region, Libya and um, Central Africa, and all these countries. That's it, that it reflects the worries of the, uh, of the um, international community about the security in the region. There is no one thing. I couldn't agree more with uh, Mr. Hedson. Yes, there is are serious issues in the area, and any gap is going to cause a huge uh, uh, issues to the civilian. We know that the mass killing by so many different issues in intercommunal uh, conflict in the area, and some um, government um, uh, soldiers or from the other section. So there is a huge issue, but this is, has been addressed. When we look at the resolution and we look at you know, on one point, on one point is helping the transitional government. The, uh, the transitional uh, justice and also building the security, helping financially. Right. So the objective and aims of the resolution is really encouraging and it really needs our support right. because it will be benefit of that. Okay, my final question is for Thibault. Abdulatif Rahman, for a lot of people watching this around the world, for whatever reason, Darfur has fallen off the agenda. They stopped talking about it. They were talking about it a lot a decade ago, 12 years ago, right? People were campaigning for it. For those who feel that Darfur is a thing of the past, what is your message to them? Uh, the genocide survivors of Darfur feel, feel grossly betrayed by the interna international community, especially after UNAMED handed over its basis and asset to the rapid support uh, forces. There is today, there is a dire need for strong international uh, presence. And it is very ridiculous in the volatile situation and explosive 
and the worst case scenario that we are talking about overall withdrawal of the UNAMED mission. UNAMED ought to be reinforced with uh, more staff and troop weaponry and protection related mechanisms in order to save lives. I appeal to the world community to rethink its plan of, of UNAMED overall withdrawal because uh, the coming phase of genocide will have uh, serious ramification on the population on right. the ground. Abdul Latif Rahman, Cameron Hudson and Abu Bakr Adam, really good to talk to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, technology may be the key to combating COVID-19, but what could it mean for our privacy? Governments are desperate to keep infection rates low and prevent future outbreaks. And contact tracing technology is thought to be the answer. Well, Singapore's Trace Together app has been quite successful already, and uh, other nations are following suit, including India, China, and the UK. But while this technology may help ease lockdown restrictions, they require vast amounts of personal data to work, and our next guest fears they could be misused by those in power. Amir Anwar is a human rights lawyer, and he joins me now from Glasgow. Good to have you back on the Newsmakers. So track and trace keeps people safe, okay. keeps people healthy, helps us stay ahead of the virus. Is your big worry, but then what? Well, uh, I beg to differ from the government. I mean, the Joint Committee on the Human Rights has already said um, you need to have essential legislation to be enacted to ensure that mass surveillance um, or personal data doesn't result in violation before the trial is rolled out. Um, there's a huge question mark over this as well, that 20% of UK society doesn't have smartphones, for instance. Mm. So does that mean the vulnerable, the weak, the poor, um, elderly, uh, minorities um, will be uh, not part of this system, which then leaves a loophole and also leaves the added danger of this sort of sense of complacency, thinking that we've got this contact tracing. The other issue arises, of course, especially with the UK government is, who are they rolling this contract out to? Um, how have they ensured that um, personal data will not be shared? We've had so many instances of in the past where um, the data has been shared. Um, you know, organizations and companies have had the information hacked. And we're talking about personal. When they say there's anonymity attached to this, there's no anonymity. Once the data is shared with the data controller, the anonymity ends. You're talking about confidential patient data. And, it, and, and some, some concerns of like computer savvy people have raised the question that it would be an easy option for people with Bluetooth to survive an app to be able to tell you if somebody sitting right. next to you, for instance, in a cafe actually has coronavirus or so, not. So what do you want them to do? Do you want them to make the argument for why this is you know, potentially good to explain the technology with transparency and then to have a debate about it so you can legislate and regulate? Well, but yes, they need to make the argument, first of all. They can't just rush this through. I mean, far too often we've seen this UK government talking about rushing things through. I mean, it was only some several weeks ago where they said you didn't need to have quarantining people arriving back in the UK. And now all of a sudden quarantining is, is, is good advice. Before they said there was to be no masks. And now they say masks um, are, are required to be introduced. They have to get their act in together. I mean, the reality mm. of it is that probably up to 60,000 people have died in this country because of COVID-19. And that's due to the incompetence of this government. Um, you know, we, it's almost as though this government is doing knee-jerk reactions and trying to sort of get itself ahead of the curve mm. and, and try and introduce sort of headline um, sound bites in order to be able to say to the people that they're doing something without actually thinking through what the reality is. Crucial um, privacy is crucial as parts of the human rights of right. British citizens. And secondly, because you need safeguards, and they haven't come up with the the issue. They have not responded to concerns of various individuals and organizations said, what about the safeguards? If you could rush through the COVID-19 bill in a space of two days, right. then surely they could put their minds to the, the legal safeguards that should be um, introduced in order to ensure that the data is not shared, that personal data is not shared, that people are protected. And answer the question, what do you do with 20% of the country that don't have a smartphone? Does that mean that we will not know about the 20% of people that we come into contact right. with right. that may be able to spread COVID-19? And then you could have you know, the second spike, which has been predicted to happen as a result of the incompetence, the lack of PPE, and all the other issues that have gone with this scandal that is coronavirus. Yeah, all major questions regarding civil liberties and privacy here. Amir, we don't have much time. I just want your very okay. short reaction to something that I came across in Bloomberg 
in doing my research for this segment, today news, Peter Till, uh, Britain's NHS allowed secrets of US technology company Palantir Technologies Inc. access to sensitive personal data of patients, employees and members of the public under a deal to help it cope with the COVID-19 outbreak. I just got that from Bloomberg today. That was released a few hours ago. Peter Till's company doing business with the NHS. Nobody knew about it beforehand. Your reaction to that? Well, the, the government has not been transparent. They've not been accountable. And that's one of the central concerns here, that the government are doing dirty deals behind closed doors. And there is no transparency and accountability. And, and people of this country need to know that their data isn't being shared. It isn't being sold on to other companies to be able to use and for them to profiteer. That was one of the concerns that we had about post-Brexit, whether this government with um, the Americans, companies, corporations will use the opportunity to open the door and to be able to sort of farm out private patient data and to then be able to contact them and for us to be bombarded. Right. That's the central concern is what, what, why the mad rush? Why are they trying to use COVID-19 as, you know, they haven't had the mad rush over COVID-19 for anything else, but all of a sudden on this issue, they're sort of trying to railroad it through without any checks and balances. I don't trust this government on anything. And I don't think the vast majority of people in this country actually trust the words that comes out of their mouths. Amir Anwar, really good to have you back on the Newsmakers. Thank you, Thank you very much Thank for you. joining us. You're welcome. Well, thanks so much for watching the show. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.